Good afternoon. This is Harry Margolis with Elder Law Answers. I'm here with Steve Riley from Atticus. And uh, thank you for joining us for the sixth seminar or webinar in our uh, series on small firm marketing. As you know, we've been uh, conceiving this as kind of a funnel, um, talking with the earlier programs about uh, how to uh, get some clients in, get them in the funnel, move them into becoming clients. And uh, two weeks ago, uh, we had a program with um, Alexis Neely about they're in your office, how do you actually get them to hire you? And we're, uh, we're jumping ahead today with Steve Riley from Atticus about talking to, after you become clients, how do they bring you more clients? And uh, most of you, or I hope a lot of you probably already know Steve. He's the uh, quintessential small firm, uh, law firm consultant, and he's with Atticus. Um, which is uh, the leading small law firm consulting firm in the country. And uh, he has a, I just saw, uh, which I can't realize, he has a new book out. Maybe he'll tell us more about the Busy Lawyer's Guide to the Laws of Practice Growth. So with uh, nothing further, I will uh, turn the virtual podium over to Steve. It's all yours. Thank you, Harry. So th th thanks for the invitation to do the presentation. I'm always delighted to uh, work with you or anything that any of the multiple businesses that you run. And, and um, Thank you. I, I really appreciate it because I know you're really committed to helping lawyers uh, improve their practices and take their game to the next level because at the end of the day, it makes a huge difference for the client, the end user. So however you listen to this, one of the great things I really love about working with lawyers is that they're always they're very very committed to making a difference for their clients, and some one of the ways to do that is to you know really quite frankly improve your practice. The better your practice runs, the more profitable it is. The bigger difference you can make, the greater impact you can have. Um, and so, as Harry kindly said. Um, are, I'm a partner with a company called Atticus, and if you want to check us out, we have two different websites. Probably the easiest website to begin to look at is called the Atticus Advantage, and that's where new new relationships usually go to check us out. And then we have a membership website that's called the Atticus AtticusOnline.com. That's where most of our clients go and hang out. Um, if there's anything that you need after this or during the webinar, uh, well, not during the webinar, but after the webinar, uh, my email address is steve at atticusonline.com, which is up on your screen. So my focus today, and we're going to we'll try and see if we can't budget 10 to 15 minutes towards the end if you have a question, so make sure you write down any questions that you have, please. Or you can, of course, uh, email them, or excuse me, you can put them through the chat function, or you can do the raise the hand function. And Lisa, who's with Elder Law Answers, will um, let us know that we have a question and we'll stop and talk about it. But the focus of my question, or the, my conversation today, is really focused at how do you get um, more business from existing clients? And, you know, we, we, we know, we know emotionally, intellectually, that we want to get more referrals. And our, our company has studied this. We've been around for 25 years. We've studied your revenue per case, your price points, how successful our firms are. And currently we're working about 400 firms at different niches. Um, obviously I have a lot of uh, passion and, and interest in the elder law field and the estate planning field because I practice in that area. Tend to probably 10 to 12 years before joining um, Atticus, and I spent another 10 to tw 10 years doing litigation before estate planning elder law. So um, I love, love, love talking about referral-based practices because everything that we show, while it's search engine optimization, while a lot of the cool things you can do with social media, um, nothing seems to touch the value of a referred case. And generally, why do we want to keep focusing on referrals? Well, in our experience, you know, satisfied clients will generate more satisfied clients. Your best customers are always going to come from your best customers. And the challenge with this is sometimes we we um, we fail to appreciate that this requires a strategic process. Because we, you know, the, when the client comes in, they've been referred by another good client. You get this really great emotional charge. Um, you're 
engagement process is easier, your ability to price is different, you feel like emotionally you're getting paid what you worth, and you have a pre-sold client most of the time, and so it's an easier sell. And really what we've learned over the years is that most lawyers approach this with what we call a default approach. And that means if they get referrals from clients, they're thrilled, and they expect more referrals from clients. But they don't have a strategic mindset or a strategic process around how do I get referrals from clients. And so why don't we do that? Well, one of the reasons we don't do that is because we don't know as lawyers, we don't pay attention to where we actually get our referrals or where business originates. Um, sometimes we don't know where our good business originates. We have uh, an idea where, where we're getting business, but we don't actually know where our best cases come from. Sometimes it's because we just don't have the skill. We haven't learned how to do it. Uh, sometimes, and this is probably a really big one for a lot of us, is that we don't don't want to ask and don't want to be seen as you know overly salesy. We don't want to look, look you know, we don't look like um, Ned the Head Ryerson from Groundhog Day. You know, we don't want to look like that insurance agent that makes us all cringe when he walks into our office. So this is a, a big fear. I don't I don't want to look too salesy. So you have to figure out how you're going to do this so you don't look like salesy, and. Uh, you've got to think about, okay, how do I start to design this process? How do I design this? So I've, you know, we've, I've brought a few techniques for you to think about, uh, you know, during our call and after our call. So the first thing you have to do is identify what your target client looks like. And this is tough, you know, this is tough. You want to think about who, who do you want, who's your A client versus a B client versus a C client. And you know, if you're not sure what your best clients look like and what your worst clients look like, I would suggest you take some time with your, your team, maybe 30 minutes, and just do an exercise. What does a great client look like and what does a bad client look like? And I don't care if you write it on a whiteboard, a smart board, flip chart, or on scratch paper. Um, it starts to start, it will start to give you a filtration method and you'll start to learn, oh wow, this is, this is a really good client and oh, this is a really bad client. Now you may have a feeling about that, but until you start to actually do the work, putting pen to paper and think it through, you really won't have the benefit of refining your focus. Then the second thing you start to ask yourself, well, if this is what our ideal client or A plus client looks like, what's important to this person? And how do they end up working with us? Because it allows us to start to refine the focusing of our marketing. And what type of legal services was this client interested in when they retained us? And what part of your practice really enticed or brought this client to you? So you want to get clear in your mind that you don't want to go after everybody. You want to just figure out who is your best and your most profitable and perhaps your most favorite people to work with. So then you can start to psychologically, I mean, you can start to describe what this person looks like demographically, psychologically, you know, your psychographics. You want to start saying, this is what this person looks like. Now, a lot of major, your major corporations um, will have a buyer profile. They'll have a buyer profile and they, may, they might have a name for this buyer, this potential buyer. So you'll start to learn that you'll have a buyer profile that's reflective of your favorite type of client. So my suggestion is start to think about who that is. So when they walk in the door, you can start to re-emphasize and start to cultivate more of these types of people. Um, the second thing is that you want to start figuring out, this is your A plus case, um, what do you want your revenue per case to be, which assumes that you know your revenue per case. So I'll use a, a very common example. Let's just say that you have a crisis component to your elder law practice, you do uh, crisis. What I would want you to do is say, well, if I've done 50 crisis cases in 2015, and I generated, a, you know, let's just say a half a million dollars in revenue for those, you know, 100 crisis cases, what was my average fee per case? Well, for some of you, I'm sure that's not the case. It may be that you generated 10 cases and you might have an average fee per case of 10,000 per case and your gross revenue was 100 grand around that. So you want to start targeting what, what was my revenue per case off my A, my a clients? What was my what was the net worth or income threshold? What did they look like? What type of family dynamic um, did that work appeal to me to you? And what what did um, you know? How do you how do you address and start trying to get that potential client to 
um, interact with you. So part of this is getting clear about your client, getting clear about your price point, getting clear what they look like, because when you start to talk to your A clients, you want to learn how to tell them, um, I want people like you, and what you want to tell them what people like you means. Uh, they might say people like you might mean uh, stressed out, overworked, dealing with parents and dealing with work. That might be what they think you mean. And really what you mean is I'm looking for a affluent professional who is a caregiver, who is committed to their parents' well-being, and um, has the power of attorney and may be in charge. So you might be looking more along that rather than what they think you're saying. So you have to start getting clarity in your mind about what an A client looks like and how to tell A, a clients or A plus clients how to refer other A plus clients. So that's step one. Step two, while this sounds simple, my experience in working with um, law firms, if I start working with maybe 10 firms, and I just came back from um, uh, the NALA conference last week, if I was, if I just randomly polled or polled 10 solo practitioners from the NALA conference, I would anticipate only one out of 10 is actually doing this. So 90% are not doing this, which is acknowledging when they do get a referral from a client. And what do I mean by that? <clears throat> when you get a referral, how are you saying thank you to your client for that referral? Is it a timely thank you? Is it something other than an email? Is it a card? Is it a gift? Is it some form of incentive? What did you say in your referral acknowledgement process? Um, and the thing is that you want to think about maybe having two to three different acknowledgement processes. So here's my rule of thumb. My rule of thumb is if someone refers you a case, they should receive a handwritten thank you card within 24 hours of the referral showing up at your firm. It doesn't mean that you talk to the client, excuse me, it doesn't mean that you talk to the prospect. It means that somebody on your staff perhaps talk to the prospect and somebody on your staff needs to bring the card to you and say, hey, look, Harry just referred in Lisa and I need you to write a thank you letter to a thank you note to Harry saying thanks for referring Lisa. We'll let you know how it develops. And Lisa has an appointment with you next week, so you want to write to Harry, thanks for the referral of Lisa. I greatly appreciate your trust and faith in me. Lisa's coming in next week. I'll let you know how it goes. Thank you, Steve. Boom, pop that in the mail, and so Harry should get that in two or three days. Of course, that's dependent on the weather in Boston, right, Harry? Um, the That would be a minimum standard for me as far as you saying thank you. Now, that is just if you've gotten a prospect. If Lisa converts to a client, then I want to send Harry another thank you. And the thank you may be everything, again, from a small gift or incentive. And I'll give you three examples of very simple gifts to give. Number one is Amazon gift cards. So this is very, very simple. You can email it. You can set up an account with Amazon. You can say, hey, really, thanks for the referral. I know you're a big reader or what have you. Um, you know, I bought you a gift card on Amazon just to say thanks. I really appreciate it. Now, of course, before everybody freaks out about this, um, you want to check out the ethics in your jurisdiction as far as sending thank yous for gifts. I mean, gifts for um referrals. Some jurisdictions actually have a, a threshold of I think about $25. Some jurisdictions have no rule on it whatsoever like it's it's uh, not addressed and some jurisdictions say yes as long as it's not unreasonably you know it has to be uh, it can't be proportional to what the value of the case was. Um, my rule of thumb is any form of thank you whether it's a $25 Amazon gift certificate, a movie gift certificate like to AMC or Regency theaters for 25 bucks which will include you know two tickets popcorn and a movie which is terrific are Starbucks you know so those are probably three pretty generic gifts that you can give people um, more customized gifts are going to be around I personally um, 
I have an account with Amazon Prime, and I personally like to send books to people. So I love to send books. Um, most of my clients are readers. Most of them are lifetime learners. So anytime I get a chance and there's something interesting that I'm reading I or something that's going on in their life, I try and have the book nailed to that. But I only send that gift if the client engages me. So let's be clear about this. With the prospect, they get a thank you card. If I get a, a, an a, an engaged client who writes me a check, then I send my referral source a gift. Now, if you're really sophisticated, you can perhaps make the gift unique to the client, but don't go there until you have a, a kind of like a stage one thank you process. A lot of lawyers go directly to doing something that's overly unique and the complexity of in, in the lack of systemization around that um, creates a lot of um, headache for the staff. So I would really say, okay, what can we do to make very simple things? It's got to be a thank you card. And if you don't have a thank you, I mean, if you don't have a formal thank you card, just go to the local stationery store or order some online and just get a box of thank you cards. It doesn't have to be overly fancy. One of the things that I've done for years is I've taken my children's artwork and had it scanned to Shutterfly and I've used thank you cards with my children's artwork on it and I've also uh, I'm an amateur photographer emphasis on really bad photography um, and I've got a whole series of thank you cards that have photos that I've taken on them so those are examples of trying to make little unique thank you cards and you know people sometimes um, uh, appreciate and acknowledge that I, I gave them something different and unique so that would be step one you've got to have a referral acknowledgement process in place before you start asking clients for referrals. It's really important, I, I can't emphasize this enough, um, don't expect people to continue to send you work if you don't acknowledge the fact that they sent you work. It doesn't have to be fancy, but thank you, thank you, thank you has to be involved in that process. Step two, uh, excuse me, step three is practice TOMA. Now, TOMA is one of the things that Harry's done brilliantly with Elder Law Answers and why you guys are so smart to invest with it because TOMA means top of mind awareness. It's where you're having a strategic way of connecting with your referral sources and clients, whether it's email, print, via webinar, via workshop, it doesn't matter, but I would strongly suggest that you have some form of top of mind awareness approach. Now, Harry, I don't know if you're still with us. You are a genius at this. Is there anything you would like to weigh in on on talking about top of mind awareness? Because you, you have done a brilliant job with Elder Law Answers here. Nope. Harry, Sorry, you're not... Steve. I, sorry, oh. I'm here. I muted myself, and then it took me a little, little while with the phone to get to the right, <laughs> the right spot to unmute myself. Um, so... Uh, I, I guess I just say, um, um, to some extent, the more the better. Uh, kind of just reminding people you're there, um, but you have to do it in a way that, again, isn't too salesy. So um, through Elder Law Answers, we provide our members the ability to send a client and referral source uh, e-letter every month, and um, and I think uh, that's great. That's why we do it. But actually, in our office, we do it weekly. And sometimes we think that's uh, maybe too much, but we seem to always have stuff to say. Um, and maybe we just have too much to say, but there's usually some news in Massachusetts, or, or I've, a, I've listened to you speak and want to say, write something about it, or, or we have something to announce, and, um, and uh, we send it out, and, um, and people seem to appreciate it. So, yeah. um, and then, so in a way, there's, there can't be too much. That's perfect. That's perfect. Um... One of the things that Harry has said that's very important, and, and, and he's understating it, is that the communication must have some form of value to the recipient. So Harry says, you know, minimally once a month, and I agree, you want to do once a month, and you could do once a week, but you've got to have good content to send once a week. So if you go once a week, which if you can pull that off, that's fabulous. But I would suggest that if you're not, you know, if you're not doing this, um, that you need to do it, and you need to do it minimally once a month, 
And elder law answers is a perfect solution to that. You know, not to give you a shameless plug, but I, I think it's a perfect well, solution. Well, we'll take any we can get. <laughs> we'll take any any that we can get. Um, so you could be like Harry, where you start um, using elder law answers, which more probably no doubt burst out of this process in your own practice. Yeah. To to going to a strategic weekly communication platform. Um, so you want to you want to in the second part of this for me, and I don't Harry, I don't know if if you feel comfortable with this. I'll, I'll share my numbers. Uh, when I first start practicing, um, my goal is to get ten people on my. And this shows you how old it is, Harry. Was getting ten people to my fax newsletter. And yeah, we did that my, for a little while. Yeah. Then my goal is to get yeah. to a hundred, and then my goal is to get to a thousand, and my goal is to get to fifteen hundred, and then we climb from there. Um, when you started your elder law practice, what was your initial goal as far as putting people on a TOMA system? It was probably around 100. I started with a print newsletter, and um, we actually just stopped it uh, this year. So we, we were doing that quarterly, and um, I finally realized it was costing twice as much as I thought it was because uh, we were sending it out to a lot of people, and um, I would get two bills at each issue, one for postage and one for printing, and I, for some reason, I never added them together. That's how, <laughs> how, how, how well I look at our budget. And uh, when I realized that, how much you're spending, I said, okay, what we're doing now is we're about to send out a postcard telling people we're discontinuing it and they should sign up for the e-letter. No, that's perfect. That's perfect. That's, um, it's really funny. I am um, one of the firms that we work with down in Miami. Um, and you don't have to do the math publicly, but he does um, his newsletter postage, and it's a massive PI firm. Um, he's mm -hmm. got about 100 employees and like 12 to 14 lawyers. His postage bill monthly, you ready for this, exceeds mm -hmm. $25,000. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot more than we're spending, but of course, he's, yeah. he's doing PI. Yeah, he's doing PI, but you know… Yeah. Um, but he's had a 20-plus year um, mailing list that he's built up, and and this is one of the things that you guys have listened about. You know, as Harry's talking about this, and we're talking, you know, thinking, of, you know, thinking out loud about this. Uh, a lot of people have moved to um, just straight email, and mm -hmm. some people that went to email are moving back to print. But mm -hmm. my suggestion is that you know use Harry's. Use Harry's platform, stay with email, and use email until you master that. And then after you master that, you can make a decision whether you want to do strategic mailers, mm -hmm. or, you know, strategic print mailers. But at least yeah. do something. You to do something. So perfect. Thank you, Harry. Thanks for jumping in on that. Oh, um, great. So the next one is cl create client only events. And client only events are a lot of fun because. Uh, a client only event, while it sounds like clients only, you are going to give clients permission to invite others because all of your clients are your friends. They're part of your family. And while you may say this is a client only event, you also want to make sure that you're communicating. However, while it's clients only, if you have a special friend or a family member that you would like to invite because you're a special client, you can always bring them. My experience is that this works a little bit better than saying, hey, we're doing a client event and we would like you to bring your best friend so they can become a client of the firm. So there's a couple of different ways to do this. Um, you know, When you're looking at an event, you want to ask yourself what kind of event do you think would be desirable to your clients? And I'll give you three types of events that I've seen people do. Uh, number one is the traditional successor trustee workshop. So if you're if you're have any form of maintenance component, if you're doing any type of um, uh, supporting the trustees after death, a successor trustee workshop is a no-brainer workshop that you can do. Uh, number two, changes in the law. Like Harry said, there's always changes, especially in his state. In my experience, in every, every jurisdiction, there's something going on. And in the third is if you can integrate a charitable event. Um, and a charitable event is something where you do a event supporting your favorite charity. I would su suggest that you just do one of these a year. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, 
I've, I've personally thrown a party with the net proceeds going to one of my favorite charities. I've done a silent auction where our team raised donations, you know, things to donate, and we did a silent auction uh, with money going to one of our client charities. And then a uh, third, which is very popular, um, but I don't, I don't golf, but a lot of people will do golf tournaments. You know, people that like to golf can do golf tournaments. So there's a lot of different ways of doing uh, client-only events. Harry, you're still there. Have you had yep. any experiences with client-only events that you'd like to share or talk about? Yeah, we really haven't done them. Um, um, I, I do have a colleague who I, a larger firm who, um, who we do a lot of trust business with, and he does a couple investment programs every year where he invites all his uh, trust clients and uh, has their investment people speak. That works. Yeah, that totally works. Um, you, there's a, so many different ways of doing client-only events in where you can showcase your talent and have people bring potential client, you know, prospective clients to mm -hmm. that. Um, you know, we could probably do a webinar just on that, just going through the pros and cons, how to budget, how to play for it. Um, you know, you can get sponsored sometimes for these events, but there's a lot of different ways. I would suggest that if you haven't done these before, pick a small one, depending on the size of your firm, pick a small one and experiment with it. And I'll give you one or two ideas for small ones. So here's a small one. Uh, cooking classes. So cooking classes are a lot of fun. Um, it is a client-only event that you can do with your friends and family and clients. And you could find a, depending on you, your locale, like in Harry's place, you probably can throw a rock and find someone who does this for a living in Boston. Yeah. But I live in a very, yeah, and I live in a very small town. In my case, I'd have to arrange it with a local chef, and we'd have to rent his his kitchen and his restaurant for a night. But that mm -hmm. would be a very unique client-only event, and that would be a simple one. Um, let me think. Oh, a second one, which for those of you that sport fans, any type of sport outing, whether it's baseball, football, hockey, etc., uh, you can can always get a a, um, a club package of some form to invite people to, and that's always a fun client event. I've done that with hockey quite a few times. So you, you, there's a lot of interesting ways of doing that. So just have fun with it. Don't get too stressed out about it. Um, so you can either do educational events or just fun events. And my experience is the fun events seem to be more effective as far as getting referrals. That's just my experience. Next one is practice the art of asking. So one of the things that I try and communicate when I talk to lawyers is that sometimes we think that all we need to do is to be a great lawyer and we should get business. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. You have to be a great lawyer with good business skills. Not great, just good business skills. And one of the business skills is client development. And I want to be clear about this. It's a skill. Anyone can learn it. I've learned it. Um, Harry is probably a natural at it, but other people I seem to say be that. natural at it. But, but it's a skill, you know? Yeah. It's a skill. So when you think about this, it's like no different than learning how to ride a bike or drive a car. You start off as a terrified novice. You work your way up to intermediate level to advanced level. And the speed by which you do that is the speed by which you practice. So the key here is asking is always a practice skill. So um, you want to identify how you want to make an ask. You want to be clear in your request. And I would say that you don't practice on your clients first. I would practice on someone who's a committed listener or someone that's willing to work with you on what they heard you say. I probably wouldn't work with your staff unless you had an extraordinary person on your staff that would give you great feedback on this. Um, this is one of the things that our coaches do a lot with our clients is have them practice their request and their ask. So I'll give you an example of a bad one and a good one. So a bad one is probably the classic one that I've heard from Northwestern agents for <laughs> years. This is this is a 30-year-old ask that's been in the marketplace forever, and why they, they haven't changed it, I don't know. So the, it goes like this. 
wow, Harry, you know, one of the ways I get paid is by not only making a commission, but by you giving me the names and addresses and phone numbers of your best friends. So one of the ways that you pay me is by giving me referrals of your best friends and family. I'll be back next week for that list. I just need names of names, addresses, emails, and phone numbers of all your friends and family um, as a referral. That's, that's one of the ways you pay me, which is, you know, I, I, I just I'm amazed that this has worked for the insurance company for years because every time I'm I see them do this I, I want to throw up in the trash can I'm like that mm -hmm. that is awful. So I'll give I'll give you a flip so I'll give you a, a, a more empowering ask. So here's the more empowering ask and I'm just going to role play with Harry for a minute. Harry, it has been an absolute pleasure to work with you. I have to tell you, I have been delighted with the level of commitment that you bring to the customers of Elder Law Answers. I've been amazed at the caliber of education you do for the Academy of Special Needs Planners. Um, your national reputation is stellar. If there's anyone that calls Atticus with your name, I would be honored to talk to them. So if there's anyone like you or out there that that you think we would be a good fit for, I would be honored for your recommendation. And if they call with your name, I'm on the phone as fast as I can. So do you guys hear the difference? So hopefully as you're listening, you hear the difference between the two. The first one mm -hmm. was really about me and why you should give me referrals. The second one was really about Harry and why I love Harry and why Harry, I think, makes a difference. And it's really acknowledgement of Harry. And I promise you that if you're going to practice asking someone like Harry or myself for referrals, you want to be clear on why you're giving why you're giving them this acknowledgement and why you're making a request. So it's a practice. So and, and I did a really quick version of that and I really did a really fast version. We could probably spend two hours just practicing that back and mm -hmm. forth until it becomes very until you're very, very comfortable with it. And one of the things that you, once you become comfortable with it, you want to teach your team how to do it, and you want to teach your associates how to do it, and so it just becomes second nature, so that you, you develop a culture of asking for referrals inside your organization. Because once again, our best clients come from our best clients. You can spend tons of money advertising for new clients and marketing new clients, but most lawyers are leaving a tremendous level of value value on the table by not asking their best clients for the for referrals. Great. The next one, customer service excellence. You have to engage your team. You have to learn how to, to teach them how to ask for referrals. You've got to make sure that you've got someone acknowledging and saying thank you. Um, you've got to reward them and award them for doing that. And you could, if you want to, I've done this myself and with other firms, build an incentive program around asking for client referrals. Now, you can make, if you've got um, by yourself as an attorney, you can ask for referrals. So Harry, how many employees do you and your partner have right now inside the law firm? 16. 16. So if we look yeah. at Harry's practice, plus, we plus teach that. 16 plus you guys, so 18. Yeah. Um, so 18, so we have 18 team members at Harry's Law Firm. So if we teach these 18 team members to make a request, and I can get 18 team members making a weekly request, I promise you that we could probably jump Harry's referrals by about a third, mm -hmm. because everyone's engaged in this. Now, one of the big key components of this, and I just want to back up for a second, you see I said customer service excellence. Harry, this has not been my experience dealing with you, but I'm going to pick on some law firms that I've dealt with. So I've had lawyers actually call me and say, Steve, I'm spending all this money and time on marketing, and I'm getting zero results. So I'll talk to them, and they'll tell me what they're doing. They're saying none of my marketing's working. The referral-based marketing's not working. I said, okay, great. Well, let me do something. I'll hang up the phone, and then I will call the office. Mm -hmm. And what I want to do is hear how they answer the phone. So I'm just going to do it in a very exaggerated imitation of what happens. So I call. The phone rings, and here's what I hear on the other line. Law office. 
and I'm like, oh my god. And I say, all right, um, hi, you know, this is Steve. I'm calling for Sam. <sighs> what do you want? Uh, well, uh, I want to become a new client. Um, Sam's on the other line right now. Can you know? I'll just give you his voicemail. And so, of course, when I get in Sam's voicemail, I say, Sam, I found your marketing problem. She worked <laughs> for you. Her name's Marge. She answers your phone. You have to look, you have to appreciate that one of the big killers for your firm from a referral marketing perspective is how people are treated by your staff. You can be a SELA, you can be board certified. You can be smarter than Harry, possibly. I doubt it, but you could possibly be smarter than Harry. It won't matter. It won't matter one iota if your people are treating prospects terribly when they answer the phone. Now, I'm going to teach, I'm also share with you two other mistakes on customer service that we've had two firms deal with. Um, mistake number one is outsourcing the answering the phone to a virtual receptionist. Mm -hmm. Okay? What I've discovered in my experience in working with other firms that have outsourced their phone answering to a virtual receptionist like uh, Call Ruby and half the dozen uh, systems out there is that it impacts their new client generation. What happens is there's a delay, there's a drop in referrals, and it usually translates to a drop in cash flow. So if you're going to use a receptionist service of some form, you want to get clear that you may give the receptionist service to existing clients, but you probably want your prospect line answered live. So you there's a big difference between providing good customer service and catching a live prospects when uh, a live prospects when they call the firm number two is that you want to think about who you're going to hire for a receptionist so I had two firms both this year or should I should say 2015 both had major both elder law both nationally known um, both are keynote speakers one lost probably 60 to 80 thousand in revenue the first month they went to a virtual receptionist service the second one uh, took a back office employee who wasn't doing a good job in the probate department and made them a receptionist. And she had no, she was like Marge. She had no business being a receptionist. She hated the job. She managed the lawyer really well and managed the lawyers really well in the firm, but did a terrible job. And it wasn't until we, we had people call in as mystery shoppers that we realized what was going on cost the firm a horrible, horrible first quarter last year. So when we talk about marketing, one of the things that you want to really appreciate, I would encourage you to look at, is what is your customer service like in your existing law firm? And don't assume that because you have an amazing resume and that you've got an incredible background, that that is going to be sufficient for them to wade through bad customer service. They're just not going to do it. They'll find somebody else that has somebody who's really nice who answers the phone with a smile on their voice. So when I say engage your team for client marketing, if you don't have good customer service, you're going to have a very, very difficult time. Harry, anything you want to add to that before I move to the next one? Uh, no, except that maybe we, I should do some mystery shopping just to check out what's going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you totally could. Totally yeah. could. Uh, in our group programs, we've done that where we've assigned people to be mystery shoppers. And so mm -hmm. we've broken people up into pairs, and we came up with like an example of a great case. And then we had another person in the group program call the firm and pretend they're a prospect and ask all these questions so they could see how they're treated. And the confidence level of the lawyers usually is really high. Like, you know, you know, I'm a really sharp dude. I've been doing this, and someone says work for me for years. She'll be able to handle it greatly. Mm -hmm. And I would say 75% of the time, the lawyers that were really confident on how their staff would handle it came back into the room shaken like physically mm -hmm. and, like shaken like oh my god that was a disaster it was a total disaster so this is a big one so I don't want to hit this too hard but but it's a it's a really big one okay great so we'll switch to um, meet the client referral network 
this is a really great one that if you have an A plus client, most of the time they're going to have their own referral network. They're going to basically um, have their own financial planner, their own CPA. They may have a business lawyer. They may have a family law lawyer. Um, they may have people that are really, really great that they rely on. Well, these are four to five people that you can be request an introduction to that can become uh, referral sources for you. So uh, one of the things that you want to put on your questionnaires, if you don't do it already, is are you working with another lawyer? If so, what type? Um, do you have a property casualty agent, like a, a property PNC agent? Do you have um, a financial planner, life insurance agent? And you want to look and see what other professional reasons, you know, are even if they're treating with a therapist, you know, these are people that um, if it's an A-plus client for you that more than likely has a very strong referral network already. The CPA is an obvious one. Oh, my goodness. You know, do you have a great CPA that you like? And if there's something that they say about that person, that person sounds like a decent potential referral source for you, ask your A-plus client to introduce you, and they'll be delighted to do that. So that's meet the client referral network. The next one is meet the family. Um, so if you're going to um, do multi-generational marketing, aiming for client events that integrate the next generation is a critical component for doing that. You can actively ask your clients to do multiple things, and this has happened to me, it's happened to other lawyers that we've worked with, where a parent will pay for their children's estate planning because their kids are might be in a position where they're raising children you know they're raising young kids at home they might not be making the money that the parent is and but the parent is you know this is their grandkids are worried about this is their kid they're worried about so they may actually do pay for their planning um, you may do a family meeting you may have a family workshop and of course, you want to make sure family are invited to client-only law firm events that we mentioned, because family is such a wonderful, wonderful referral source. I've, I've, I've usually been referred up, not down, but referred up by my clients and the families, meaning like higher net worth, more interesting cases. Um, so you probably are, you know, have the opportunity to multi-generational planning, but you have to think about strategically how do you integrate the family into your practice. Harry, anything you want to add here? Uh, no, all, all these things are uh, getting me to think more about what we're doing. It should be doing. Okay. Good. Um, great. So the next one is um, thinking about how to build your firm activity engagement. And one of the things that you want to think about is if you are actively involved in a community association, whether it's like Parkinson's, uh, Alzheimer's, hospice, some a cause that you care about. Um, can you integrate your clients in this? And my suggestion is to be careful. Sometimes people uh, will get actively involved in their church, their synagogue, which is totally fine, but don't expect someone who doesn't have your same faith to get involved in a mission or a cause for your church or synagogue, so be careful. Second thing applies to politics. Um, you know, we have two predominant political parties in this country, and if you are doing campaigning and, and fundraising for one party, be prepared that there's a high probability, unless all of your clients are from that party, um, that you will annoy those people in your client base that are not part of that party. And, and it's, you know, it's, it can be a very divisive experience if you start to let your politics be known um, throughout your client base. So just be careful. Mm -hmm. My suggestion is if you're going to do a um, cause related, make sure it's a charitable cause, something that's not going to offend people, and it's something that you can engage your team, your firm, and your clients and your referral sources in. So if you're in the elder law field, any form of elder law, I mean any form of senior related cause should be a, a easy one to do. Um, Harry, anything you want to add to, to this because I'm right at the end, we're going to open up for questions, so we have a, few, you know, a good 10, 15 minutes left for questions. Um, I don't think so. I mean, we've done some of this um, and maybe we should look, go back to it. We, we've, um, we've done Alzheimer's walks and I uh, ran the marathon once and raised money 
and um, and we did we participated in Alzheimer's bike ride. Um, I, I did run for office once, and it uh, was an excuse to get my name out. And how did that work? Did, was that a good experience? I think it was. Well, it was, it was a lot of work, <laughs> and uh, but it was a good experience. I, I didn't win, but I, I was a strong second of three candidates. Uh, couldn't too many challengers to beat the incumbent, um, but um, but yeah, it was definitely a good experience, and I think it was, I think it uh, I think business increased the following year. What may I ask? What office you ran for? It's a very arcane office, uh, uh, dating back to colonial times in Massachusetts, uh, called Governor's Council, and they also have one in um, they have the same thing in New Hampshire, but that's it. And uh, mostly, what what it does now is um, approve judges who have been nominated. Oh, gotcha. Or not. Uh, that's good. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, yeah. That's been my experience. So for those of you, that, uh, Harry did a very, um, I'm sure he, if he won, he'd be delighted to do the off, to do the job, but a very mm -hmm. common, a very common old school, traditional marketing technique for lawyers that don't know how to market is to run for office. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know what Harry's thoughts are on this. I've been, um, I've had a partner who's a, I had worked for a guy as a state rep. I had a partner as a state rep. I had a partner who was a retired state senator. All I can tell you is, in my experience, running for office is a full-time job, and your practice becomes a part-time job. So if you decide to run for office, you've got to have your time management together, and you've got to be prepared to know when to quit campaigning, and focus on cash flow. That's probably the two things I have to say about running for office. Harry, anything you want to add to that that you can think of when you ran? Yeah, well, there's just not enough hours in the day. So I um, I tried to, I compartmentalized. So various days or parts of the day were for campaigning and other parts were for the law practice. I kept I was pretty rigid about that. Perfect, perfect. Um, with that, uh, let's go ahead and see if you have any questions. And um, Harry, of course, is yep. on the call with me. So if you guys have any questions, don't hesitate to uh, jump on the, f you know, either unmute yourself or. Uh, I guess I probably let's see how that works. I know that we can uh, if you if you type in a question, um, maybe that's the best way to do it. And we do have one, uh, so I want to read that to you, Steve. Okay. Um, my partner practices family law. He feels constrained from approaching his divorce clients for referrals. Can you comment on how he might approach those clients? Um, yeah, you know, that, that's a great... Uh, I'm trying to recover first emotionally from a partner that won't refer you work. I'm struggling with this in my head. Why would your partner <laughs> not refer you work? I think, oh, I, think, I think you're asking just asking on behalf of the partner. How can oh, on behalf he, of the partner. Okay, I'll give you... He, how can he ask his, his, his clients? His clients. I, here are three ways to do it. Uh, number one, I would put together a one-page guide of what to do with your estate plan when you're thinking about getting a divorce. Mm -hmm. a, then a one-page plan or one-page guide of what to do during your divorce and then a one-page guide of what to do after your divorce. So if you can just do a one-pager and give this to your partner and integrate that into your partner system, I think that would be really great. I think I wouldn't hesitate to do a webinar, a video, and a workshop. And I would probably do a workshop once a year or twice a year for your partner's clients and ex-clients about what mm -hmm. to do now that they're divorced. Um, I used to do a CLE for family law lawyers called How to Keep My Ex's Paws Off of My <laughs> Kid's Money. So, so there's a huge market out there. I think um, usually somebody when they're done with the divorce is so happy to get away from their lawyers. Lawyers are really shy to refer work to other lawyers, mm -hmm. but I think the most committed ones will do that. So that would be my immediate response. Um, you could probably do it. That would probably be pretty easy to do. Yeah, good. So the next question is when you do small events, how many clients do you typically invite? Uh, that's a great question. Um, 
it depends on how big your practice is and how many you think that you can get there. Uh, one of the things that I I had a classroom at my office so we could hold 25 to 30 so we we would be limited to the classroom size which we try to cap out at 25 but if we took tables out we could probably fit 50 in there and mm -hmm. so our clients knew that if we did a client workshop it was limited to that however twice a year we would do ballroom size events at hotels that might be um, massive like 150 to 300 people so mm -hmm. it really depends on the size of your practice. I, if you haven't done a lot of client events, I would start small, maybe 25 mm -hmm. to 30 if you can pull that off and get your confidence up. And then afterwards, do a debrief what worked about it and what didn't work. Good. Anyone else have any other questions? So... Um, if not, um, this was great for me. I've been sitting here, Steve, uh, typing away and thinking about <laughs> things things we should be doing. Oh, and, I thought you were doing uh, Well, that's so good to hear. I thought you were doing email. Email. Been <laughs> what was that, Steve? I said thank you. I thought you were doing email. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Or the typing. No. Um, I had my full attention. And uh, so I don't know how it, how it works for everyone else, but this has been uh, great for me, and I'm going to implement a lot of these ideas in our practice. And I don't know, Steve, if you want to uh, remind people how to reach you, uh, if they have any follow-up questions, and um, there it is. And yeah, sure. uh, any last words that you'd like to say? No, uh, just thank you again, Harry. Thank you. And I would encourage those of you that uh, if you are going to implement, just pick one thing out of the call. Don't try and implement everything. Just pick one thing out of the call and try and implement it over 90 days. And my experience is that the the ability of asking your best clients for referrals will after time build such a wonderful momentum in your practice that it will do two really great things for you. Number one, it will increase the joy that you experience every day. There's nothing quite as wonderful as going in every day in representing and working with people you really love and care about. It just makes mm -hmm. a huge difference. Um, and number two, you will make a lot more money because these people will love and care about you and they will not be the type of people that will try and underprice you, undercut you. They'll, they'll be really great people and it, it won't happen overnight. It, it will be a strategic process. My experience for most people that attend the WD Revenue Workshop or start to work with us, we usually see a doubling or tripling of incomes. Um, after two to three years, it usually never occurs in the first year. It's usually two to three years down the process. It takes about a year to clean up a lot of mess and get their attention. Second year is um, really more about strategic thinking and process. They get a little bit more proactive. Third year is really where we see a huge return on investment. And by third year, they start to freak out a little bit because they're not used to making this much money and having this much time off. So they get a little anxious and they start to do goofy things. And my job is to say, don't. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Put the gun down. Mm -hmm. Shoot yourself in the foot. Um, so I, I, that's what I just say. You know, you really have this unique opportunity to to um, uh, have a really great practice fueled by great clients. Um, if you want to know more about us or talk to us directly, uh, go to the website atticusadvantage.com. And at that website, you'll see something called a practice growth diagnostic. And a practice growth diagnostic is a uh, small investment by you. It's up $275. It includes some self-assessing tools to figure out where you're at. And it also includes a DISC profile, which is a, a, a really strong personality assessment that allows uh, you to get some insight to how you prefer the world to work and what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are in certain areas. Um, and we help you look at that so you can understand how that might impact your marketing, your pricing, your managing um, of staff because that DISC, it's called the DISC profile, um, has a huge impact. So if you want more information on that, you can go to the website and look at the practice growth diagnostic and we can, um, we'd be delighted to talk to you about how we could help you take your practice and, quite frankly, your life to the next level. 
So I think this is my final comment, Harry. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, thank you very much, Steve. And it sounds like a good life just uh, going in to work with people you want to work with. And uh, just remind everybody that our next webinar is in two weeks. It's with Ron Baker. And it's uh, going back to, uh, I suppose, the initial client meeting um, on pricing. So it's titled Pricing on Purpose, Learning from Behavioral Economics. So I'm looking forward to that as well. It's a terrific, Ron Baker uh, is terrific. Uh, so okay, you, you know, guys, I, don't... Yeah, I know Ron, and um, you know, it's been a long time since I interact with Ron. I had a, the pleasure of doing a um, webinar conference call years ago with Ron, and we've had Ron come in and do presentations with our client base. He's a terrific guy. All of his books are very, very interesting, but if you have the opportunity, Harry, it's a great choice. If you have the opportunity to listen to Ron, I would encourage you guys to come listen. Um, Ron's an evangelist for killing the billable hour and moving to mm -hmm. what you call value pricing, and it's a terrific. His, his message is terrific, and his presentations are terrific. You can't go wrong with Ron. Sounds like a good tagline. <laughs> can't go wrong with Ron. Right. <laughs> All right, Harry. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Steve. All right. Bye.